special week for us here because this week is Mental Health Awareness Week, and we're doing a series of live shots, or live streams as they call them, you know, with special guests that are coming into the studio to um, open the conversation, have the conversation, and continue the conversation on mental health. And this time I'm joined by a good friend of mine, um, Sean Liddell from Mindful Training Limited. How are you doing, Sean? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Great to be here. Well, you know, I mean, Sean, what's great is that, like, uh, we've been talking to several young people thus far, and, you know, not like you're not a young person, but, you know, <laughs> you're a person that comes with various experience because we want to have, like I said, sustain this conversation on mental health. Yeah. And um, so one of the things I found curious and interesting is this project that Michael Crane is doing mm -hmm. called Mental Health First Aider. Yes. So can you just explain to our audience a little bit about um, I mean, your program is an accredited program, yeah. but about what Mental Health First Aider is. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm an accredited Mental Health First Aid trainer, uh, accredited by MHFA.org. The MHFA are the only recognised uh, certification from the government and the Royal Society for Public Health. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we train people in the workplace yeah. to become Mental Health First Aiders. And that's to, to be able to sign and signpost people not treat and diagnose. So it's a great extension for people uh, uh, to help the health and well-being of the workplace, as opposed to the physical first aid. So it's all about um, having being able to have conversations in the mm -hmm. workplace for people recognizing who need support instead of being afraid to. You know, if somebody's been off for several days, if somebody changes their behaviours, it's being able to approach them. Yeah. And, and, and learning how to have that sort of conversation, but then learning how to um, signpost and look for any symptoms yeah. and look for relevant support organisations. Now, what's interesting is, is because, I mean, one of the first things we see in your sessions is being having non judgmental listening mm -hmm. skills. Yeah. And, like, what it also made me think about was, like, you know, this is a really interesting project to set about because. Um, it really opens it up for everyone, mm -hmm. right, when it comes down to if you're going in as a doing first aid, you know, like, we all are pretty much aware of epilepsy, mm -hmm. awareness, like, you know, you're not supposed to put the, uh, 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 what's this, tongue suppressor yeah. in their mouth, whatever, you know, yeah. you know, you're not supposed to, like, do anything like that, but, you know, um, can you tell us a little bit about what, um, people will learn on your course when it comes down to dealing with people with, uh, mental health conditions or symptoms and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so it looks at the most common uh, mental illnesses mm -hmm. and what it also does, so you're talking about uh, depression, anxiety, excuse me, we're looking at personality disorders, yeah. uh, obviously uh, self-harm as well, psychosis, mm -hmm. schizophrenia. And we're looking at uh, signs and symptoms of, so it makes it easier to, to, to spot, because um, uh, the conversation from the person that's going through the experience may not be one that they're willing to have. Yeah. So to how do you approach somebody? So we have an algorithm that we take people through, um, oh, really? which which helps people actually approach in the first place. So and that's that's a massive thing because obviously well, I guess you know we've all seen situations and people where we've felt a little bit uncomfortable because we don't know what to do. Yeah. So it's all about being able to and having the confidence what we say, what words to use, what words don't be used. And it's all about having those conversations that will result in something, yeah. and hopefully, even if uh, even if there's nothing to be done, at least you've had that conversation and you can feel good about yourself. Yeah. But mental mental health, mental uh, illness is so prevalent everywhere. Not not just the workplace, obviously, but it's so so prevalent now in today's society yeah. that we we treat everyone. We have physical first aiders everywhere. It's law. It's legislation. But there is nothing for mental illness, and of course, it's been swept under the carpet for so long. Yeah, yeah, because it's kind of like what you said when we were talking about it was like normalizing a conversation, you know, exactly. because like basically what we want to be able to do here is really help to break the stigma around it all. Yes. You know, and that's what I was saying is like I gave an example, like I went to um, um, the center and, um, you know, um, a woman who was in a wheelchair, you know, um, by um, whatever was going on for her, she was making noise and, you know, and I think what sometimes what we do in today's climate mm -hmm. is we tend to just kind of like freeze, you know, like uh, pretend that we don't hear it. Yeah. Is that what we should be doing, though? Uh, there's, there's no right or wrong. And that's, mm -hmm. that's again, something that you know, comes through the non-judgmental listening. It comes through our behaviors. Yeah. So it's understanding that, that what we do is, is okay. So you'll be okay with that. However, mm -hmm. um, as, 
as trained mental health first aiders, it's to give people the confidence to, to not ignore that, to, yeah. to approach the person, um, and just in a completely normal way, as you would with anybody else. Mm. And then have that conversation and ask certain questions. Yeah. So when it comes to suicide, which obviously is a topic that we do cover, yeah, yeah. have to cover, um, then it's about being able to, uh, to ask those very, very open questions, but ask them non-judgmentally. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the, um, the key here, because like you were, you were giving me uh, some stats mm. and everything, and you know, it's like some really powerful ones and everything. So it can be related like, to them, like we were talking about like suicide, for yeah. example. Yeah. So, so suicide, I mean, that's, this is, uh, it, it absolutely blew my mind when, when we were talking about this uh, on the course and, and finding out these things. So we did some true or false quizzes mm. and uh, we find, found out that there's uh, road traffic accidents. If you think about you know, the chaos on the roads and how many people die on the roads, yeah. we lose three times as many people to suicide as we do to road traffic accidents. Wow. And in any given year, one in five, 20.6% of us experience suicidal thoughts. So at this point, you know, whoever's watching, uh, uh, whoever's listening to the podcast, yeah. all you have to do is look around. And if there's one, two, three, four, five of us in a room, then it kind of brings it home to us, hopefully. It does, it does, especially when I look around this room. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about me. But, <laughs> but you know, we, we kind of like, we talked about that and we were talking about two particular takeaways. Yeah. Yes. You know, from, from those kind of statistics where, you know, like, um, you know, even though you said um, there's always hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, it's kind of hard, you know, to just say that to people, you know, who've been living in a dark cave for yeah. a while, you know, because it's still somewhat empty, you know, mm -hmm. echoey. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, what I thought was most powerful was the first one, which was? Which was? Give me a quick. All right. Well, don't be afraid of the conversation. That was it. That was it. I have a short, short term memory. No, I'll you now. All right. No, <laughs> yeah. No, I think is. that is the most powerful yeah. thing is, is that because what happens is with these statistics being so high, it's yeah. mainly because of people not feeling like they can talk to someone. Exactly. And everything, which is why, we're, again, we're trying to open a conversation. And just also as a reminder to people while this is on, you know, like if you have any questions that are in the chat, you know, either you can like, you know, type them in and then someone can either read that to us or... You know, when you watch this program and you can uh, type in your questions in the chat, I will at least be following the chat. Hopefully, John will as well. Yeah, yeah he can answer any questions yeah. later. Yeah, you know, to, yeah. and watching uh, the program. So now, um, let's go a little bit to the origin story there, John. Right? You know, it's like being a superhero. So. <laughs> but no, but I mean, for you, you know, um, besides what you're doing now with Mental Health First Aider, yeah. the origin, you started uh, mindful training, am I right? Yeah. So, uh, tell me a little bit about Mindful Training Limited, where that come from. So, do you want to go back to my experience, my actual experiences? I would love to, to go back from there. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was, um, I'm just, I'm just a normal kid that was ra raised in Cheshire, um, went through the school system, and did everything that society said that he was supposed to. And um, I've suffered two mental challenges, mental illness challenges through through mm -hmm. my life. Uh, first time was when I had my. my so, mm. and um, after that, uh, nothing, they say nothing prepares you for kids. Yeah. And in my case, nothing could ever prepare or come near. So I, I suffered from depression um, after the birth of my first child. Mm. And um, that, was <laughs> that was really, really bad. Um, left me with hypersensitivity. So now uh, if I hear crying, especially crying is one thing. I did, there was a great book by a midwife at the time that everybody was recommending to mothers and fathers, new mothers and fathers, that you had to get this. Mm. And it, there was one stage of it that controlled crying. And mm. my, my uh, wife couldn't uh, do the controlled crying. And so I had to do it. So I had to sit next door in the bedroom and listen to my baby son crying until he stopped, until he learned to get into our routine. Wow. And so uh, I didn't realize what I was doing to, to myself then. Um, and this doesn't happen all the time, obviously. But to me, that and several other things um, just just put me into that place that you're talking about. And I found myself uh, affecting work massively. And I'd get up at, um, at that time I was working for Whitbread, uh, quite a senior position. Mm -hmm. um, and I was based out of Luton. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning before he awoke. 
I'd creep out so that um, I could get down there and find lay by that I could have one or two hours sleep, wow. which was my best uh, best sleep that I was having in days. <laughs> in a lay by. Oh yeah, 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 just in the car, and that that was my escape. Um, mm-hmm. You, the guilt that you feel because of that, because you're away, and the thoughts. And th- this is the thing that I've never been able to reconcile within myself, but I, the thoughts that you have um, are horrendous about harm, not harm to, not you harming, but harm that could come to mm-hmm. um, my son. And that, that, that was just something that I found um, impossible to cope with. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it did have a, a physical effect, it had obviously a massive mental mm-hmm. effect on me. And then eventually uh, uh, the family support was there to push me yeah. to the doctors and went to counselling. Best thing that I ever did. Yeah. Singularly. Well, maybe. Best thing. Is it because also it was just the fact of talking to someone? Because when you brought this up um, when we were doing the show notes, it's like I thought, wow, this is really powerful because mm. we always are focused so much on the women in mm-hmm. postpartum depression and, and the stuff that is going on. And, yeah. and you just said about a book that was for um, mothers and fathers, yeah. but you know, mainly for mothers. Mm-hmm. And you know, so this is kind of like an ignored arena, isn't it? You know, yeah. like fathers who oh, are yeah. facing you know, this kind of like emotional state kind of yeah. thing. So obviously, you know, you uh, having a conversation you said it was very helpful, but it's just, I mean, did you did you get to experience other um, men or fathers like yourself? Um, no, no, I, uh, again, I was, I was stuck in that man up. Well, uh, we are all stuck in the man up, yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was a corporate guy. I wasn't, um, it wasn't, it was some, wasn't something I could raise. I talked to a couple of friends that didn't work, but you know, you couldn't talk to your, to your man, because I was a director at the time. Well, you, you, talk to, the words. you talk to a senior director, and that's a complete weakness at that time. You know, you're never gonna go anywhere with that. So that was all washed under the table. There was nothing like that. So I just, luckily enough, it, it, the counseling that I received through the NHS mm. was absolutely amazing and, and really did set me on the right path. And that's what I needed. So yeah. for a period of about three to six months, it was about five to six months actually. And that really, really helped me. It's mm. like, luckily I've had the sensitivity, but um, so just <laughs> just through the week, um, there was there was a family, um, young families and, and kids absolutely screaming in my local Aldi. Ooh. And, Ooh. and I could stand it for so much. And then at one point I, I, I literally put my basket down and just had to walk out, just left my basket and just had to walk out and just have a walk around the, uh, the business park, yeah. the retail store. So just to, just to get myself back and employing breathing techniques and mindfulness techniques, and I'm okay. So I'm okay, I can handle, I can manage things, but that's the... Is yeah. that why you felt that there was a need for such a training? Oh, then? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so cut to, yeah, I got made redundant in 08 and then suffered depression for the second time because I was unemployed for 13 months. I, I actually, I had to tell people 13 months. The, the true story is that it's two years. True story was two years. So I started uh, the, the, the training company because there was there was nothing else to do. Because mm. I was a corporate banker at the time. And the last thing I am is a corporate banker. So I find my, found myself for ten years doing something that I hated, mm. um, going up and down each year, um, almost getting sacked, and then getting rewarded with loads of prizes because you're you're up and down. Yeah. And um, and so I was out of work and went through uh, a serious depression in living in Liverpool City Centre. And um, then it was only by absolutely and utterly reaching the bottom point mm. that I, I have ever done, which was not to consider suicide. Um, so, I, and I'm always honest about that whenever I talk, because it's very important that we are always honest. Yeah. But it was it was the deepest part of the depression that I've ever reached, and it was through having one conversation with one ex-work colleague who was just fantastic, mm. who got me into meeting husband who's an organizational psychologist who asked me one question which was what makes you happy and that's where we started I, I couldn't even answer that I couldn't even answer the only thing I could answer was what doesn't make me happy and that was banking mm. and but that was the start of the conversation for me and him so we've gone on now to form mindful training which is a group of oh, really? yeah. eight eight individuals and what we are is what we like to do is, is to be able to offer one person or a thousand people a complete one-stop shop. So we have an organizational psychologist, we have a clinical psychologist, we have one of the, the top NLP guys in the country, a neurolinguistic program, which is such a powerful range of techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, a healer and somebody that does a master in complementary therapies. 
and then myself who's become accredited in mindfulness so mindfulness practitioner as well as a mental health first aid practitioner and obviously I've got my own corporate background but we've had a fantastic corporate trainer as well mm. who does all the leadership uh, challenging conversations management programs you could want so basically whatever a company is needed because the, the big untapped market for me it, are the SMEs mm-hmm. you know, yeah. you look at Liverpool for example this city uh, survives by small to medium enterprises yeah. and that's you know that's that's one person right the way up isn't it 250 and there are so so many of them but they don't have the time they don't have the investment to put mm. into things like mental health first aid yeah. but if you've got 10 20 30 employees Mm-hmm. You've got employees with mental issues, mental health issues. Well, this sounds like a pitch for the event industry. Here you go, one powerful super team over here. You know what I mean? But I mean, uh, no, seriously, man. Yeah. I mean, like, it sounds it sounds amazing. But I I want to get back to uh, you know male you know depression and yeah. the need to talk to someone yes. because I yeah. think it's really amazing for you to come on and share this because. Especially being above the line, you know mm-hmm. what above the line is, yeah, yeah. right? You know, so above the line is kind of like those people who are in the top echelon of the company, and not the below the line workers uh, that make the company actually run. Yeah. So to be in that above the line and uh, face, you know, the depression, post-farm depression, or whatever you want to look at, mm-hmm. is finding yourself with no one to talk to. So I mean, like, what would you say to people out there who might be in that state, like? Alan Sugar, who could he talk to? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I mean, because you're people too, right? So exactly. I'm just saying this. Um, so obviously coming from out of the other side into mindful training and everything, what, what could you say to uh, uh, a man who was finding himself kind of like at this stage? Yeah, like what could he do? Or what could you say? Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things, I guess. You know, um, uh, men aged 40 to 49 have the highest suicide rate. Um, so it's really, really important for anything around that age, and obviously it's had a massive knock-on effect for younger, um, younger men. Um, suicides, there's, there's three times as many men that complete suicide as women. Mm-hmm. So yeah, men are, are a very important uh, part of the population to consider. And the higher up the, the organisational ladder you are, the more the stresses are that you can still, because there is still stigma, of course there's still stigma, and part of our job is, is to destigmatize this, but how do we do it? It's about enabling as many, empowering as many mental health first aiders to be able to uh, have that conversation upwards as well as down. Mm-hmm. So um, with, with human resources, HR, it's, if we can get into places like that, we help them understand that this is not just for physical first aiders, this is not how it works. It does work like, kind of like what you're talking about on a network basis. Mm-hmm. The more people that you have, the easier the conversation is, and it's got to be at every level. Yeah. So this goes from top down. Yeah. Well, um, just on a, like a side note, like mm. you know, kind of like going down the side street for a second is is like because um, we know each other from like uh, links online and everything yeah. like that, and you know, which again when you talk about small SMEs, you know, networking and people coming together to support one another. Yeah. There was something that really happened that happened like what, a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. that was huge in the news where like uh, Thomas Cook had uh, gone down. Yeah. Uh, speaking about them above the line people, <laughs> but either way, many people were like put out of work. Yeah. And put on the street and like not knowing where they were going to end up or what to do. And um, you know, I don't know who set it up, with, but maybe tell us about it that. Members of this group, um, local group in Liverpool, decided to have a day mm. um, of what for these people workers yeah. that Thomas Cook speaks of. So we, we didn't publicise this because the absolute the, 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 the key is for us. It was not to, nothing to do with publicity for ourselves. But uh, Tom Phillips um, in the networking group, uh, fantastic, great human being, just put on one night. Um, I feel really awful about this. This this is just terrible. Is there anything we could do? And another guy who's just incredibly positive and I think he knows everybody in Liverpool, Dave Verberg. He does know everybody in Liverpool. <laughs> he, t- he turned around and he was the first one on, of course, and said, of course we can, and it went from there. So there were other people, there was myself, there was Joe Infinity. Chris McGill was there. 
Chris McGill, uh, Mick Ryan, um, and uh, Pam Case. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we put together a day and invited uh, as many sort of ex-commerce club employees and ran it in Liverpool City Centre for free. And we just did half-hour stops to help people. We had 35 ex-commerce club employees turn up. Mm -hmm. um, and we did little slots about. So we all did our specialties. So jo Jonathan has got fantastic recruitment knowledge, a wonderful recruitment company. So she was helping, not only helping people get back into work straight away, but taking them through interviews, interview techniques and CVs. And some of the people were the stories you hear in here, the, 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 the employees have a job for 18, 20, 25 years, scared stiff, mm -hmm. don't know how, no, don't know how to answer what, what is an interview, no idea. Or I found myself in a dark and yeah. I don't know how to get out. Yeah. yeah. We had, what had, what, and you know, Pam K, hey, we all had our thing, work on mindsets mm -hmm. and beliefs and everything. So just to hit people as soon as they possibly were, were in this experience. Yeah. So that the, it didn't enable them to, to keep going down that dark path that we know about, but just to stop them in their path and say, look, there is another option. Um, and one person who, who was brilliant, and she was, she was so open, she said she, she felt so bad that she honestly didn't know whether she could get out of bed that morning mm. when she came here. The feedback was, was brilliant. The feedback was absolutely wonderful. Um, I offered, I thought, <laughs> I thought, I know, I'll offer four places, four free places uh, as a bit of a donation. And of course, I had about 15 people come up to me at the end and say, oh, we have a free place. And you just you can't say no, can you? Absolutely so, not. <laughs> but uh, I know you're going <laughs> to. So on, that happened on the Wednesday. And then I had five of the people that were there on the Wednesday come on to the mental health first aid course mm -hmm. on the Thursday and Friday. And by the end of the Friday, they left and their feedback, and they said to thank everybody that had done the event, their mindset was just incredible. Mm -hmm. And to see somebody that, you know, I know how it affected me, and it can seem like, you know, a massive end, and I don't want to say what sort of end it looks like, but it did feel like that for some people. And for them to leave on that Friday, looking forward to the weekend of complete positivity, and not toxic positive, not something that was unrealistic. Mm -hmm. This is something where they had changed and worked on their mindset and were very focused on what they were going to do. Was was quite amazed, but still realistic about their own situation. Yeah. Knew there was no short term fix. No. But some there will be. But yeah. yeah, it was just for us. You know, we we got our pen because it was just incredible to do so. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, so I had asked you, like, you know, about some other like. Uh, charities or organizations um, that you were looking at interested in or wanting to recommend and um, you were talking about the life rooms yeah which I mean I used to work at the life rooms and it's a very good place they have great recovery college and over there and stuff like that I mean what about them did it intrigue you and uh, and you wanted to talk about the, yeah, the, there's, there are so many the, the beauty about Liverpool is mm. that uh, there's a website called live well Liverpool so it's, there, there are two websites, so not to be confused. I think with, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah it's Live Well, uh, which is the NHS, but there's Live Well Liverpool. If you use those two keywords, if you put into Google, then that's uh, built by uh, Healthwatch, which is a CIC put together for Liverpool CCG, mm -hmm. and that's got a whole, that's got hundreds and hundreds of resources within Liverpool, South Sefton, and some national organisations uh, that can help for addiction, substance abuse, depression, anxiety. Uh, suicide, bereavement, loneliness, there are so, so, so many. Wow. And it's everything that's on there has been approved, gone through an approval process by an organization, a great organization in Liverpool called PSS. Oh yeah, I know that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's was, for me, that's always one of my first stops. Life Rooms is, is an absolutely amazing organization um, and the work that they do. So that's always my first stop when you go through there. You can find, um, um, hopefully you'll find this a, a wee bit interesting, so there's a person called Tara the Belly Dancer. Tara the Belly Dancer? Tara the Belly Dancer. Why would I find her interesting? <laughs> and Tara the Belly Dancer does belly dancing. However, she's a I charity. So. She's a charity. Really? But she does it. Well, last time I checked, because we just, somebody came across it when we were doing training and um, looking at resources, and they found Tara the Belly Dancer. Okay. But what they also found was that she was a charity and she did it for free on the Wednesday. Now, belly dancing will be fantastic for some people because you think about it, you think about it's in a group, so it could be to do with social isolation, it could be to do with loneliness, it could even be bereavement, it can help with diet, nutrition, exercise, you know, part of a, a weight management regime, change of life, it can be anything. Yeah, yeah, it can help with so, so much. So there are, there are some incredible things out there that we would never come across. 
no. across. So Live Well Liverpool is absolutely my first stop to find uh, support resources. Wow, that's just, <laughs> that's amazing. And, you know, Sean, I just gotta tell you, you know, I would love to just thank um, um, you for coming in for this conversation because like, especially when, you know, we get into the whole, like uh, male depression, I face male depression myself. So, I mean, like in that aspect, it's always good, I think, you know, like to talk with someone else about this and help one feel that they're not alone. Yeah. But I mean, like, so just also so that way we get the statistics out of the way, you know. So the next course for the MHFA is going to be November fourteenth to fifteenth at the Cotton Exchange right here That's in it. Liverpool City Center. Yep. Um, if you're interested in taking such a course that really focuses a lot on um, everything that we talked about, you can contact Sean at Sean at Mindful Training dot Limited. That's LTD. If anybody didn't know what that was. I think that people don't know about the UK or something like that. <laughs> 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 like, <you> know, <laughs> Sean at MindfulTraining.ltd. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make sure that before we went that we hadn't stated that. But no, but actually, I also just think that this sounds like a really good course for a lot of people just to be able to, you know, like, not just look, because we've all done the first day training courses yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. But this yeah. sounds like this is the first day course is a difference. Yeah. It's new. It's now part of, as you just said, a part of the government regime since the 2019. Yeah, when well, that's when the first started. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. even though it's been around since 2017. Yeah, yeah I'm just trying to show I have no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but once again, thank you very much for coming in, Sean. And uh, it's been a really good and deep conversation. And again, it's like uh, you follow, uh, you find this um, chat room going at any point in time. You can always ask questions within the chat. You know, uh, we really encourage people to do that with all the shows that will be going on this week. Um, so, um, and, and signing off, I just want to thank Sean Adele once again. Um, I am Chase Johnson Lynch. You're here at Condo Online, and we'll be continuing um, these uh, mental health awareness week uh, conversations. We have several people coming in tomorrow, and tomorrow's going to really be a busy day. So, you know, uh, sure. tune in. You know, so we have like uh, I don't know before. <laughs> like, well, what's going on? But yeah, so thank you very much for tuning in um, to uh, the live stream with uh, Condor Online. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Jay. Thank you very much.